So this is the iPhone 6s, originally released in September 2015. This thing will be celebrating its fifth birthday come the release of the new iPhone. However, at this point in time, many still swear by it due to the mechanical home button and the headphone jack. Not to mention the incredibly affordable prices. But if previous patterns are true, then this may be the last year of support that the 6s gets. So should you still buy it in 2020? Let's find out. First of all, as usual, we're going to be taking a look at the specs. The iPhone 6s features an Apple A9 processor, two gigabytes of RAM, which honestly isn't that much by today standards, but we're going to be talking all about what this means in the performance section. Storage variations of 16 to 120 gigabytes, which is a nice range. Honestly, my personal iPhone only has 64 gigabytes, and I never struggle with space on this thing. But if you do use your local storage a lot, then this may be a key consideration, as the storage on the 6S isn't expandable. The screen is 4.7 inches, has a resolution of 750 by 1334, and a brightness of 550 nits. Following on from this, the battery is rated at 1,750 milliamp hours, and the 6S weighs in slightly heavier than the 7 at 143 grams. Now, these may not be blazingly innovative specs five years down the line, but in general, on iPhones, I don't really find specs to be that important. And while they're definitely something to look for and I encourage on the Android side of things, on the iOS side of things, it matters significantly less because Apple has the resources to optimize for every single one of their devices. That said, not sure how true this will be almost five years later. Guess we'll find out. Following on from this, we have the build quality. And on the 6S, it's pretty solid. It features the unibody aluminium design, which features the same 7000 series aluminium that we saw on the iPhone 7. Of course, this does mean no wireless charging. And on the front, we have a screen made with an ion exchange process, which in return helps reduce scratches and cracking. I've been using this thing entirely without a case. I have dropped it a few times and it's still in one piece. Don't get me wrong, it might be better, but realistically, it won't be able to withstand every fall. So as always, I suggest using a case. The iPhone 6s also has a protruding camera lens, which isn't pure sapphire, unlike the iPhone 7 and later. Now, this is a problem because the scratch lens can cause a lot of issues with the camera. And the fact that it's sticks out just makes the likelihood of that happening higher, so all the more reason to get a case. Also, despite some tests where they've submerged this thing in water for over an hour, the iPhone 6S has no official IP rating. So if you don't want to risk your phone, make sure you don't take it into the shower or what else has water? the ocean. Overall, while there are some shortcomings, I think that Apple did a really good job building this phone. There were no bending issues like there were with the 6, and the higher quality aluminium is a nice touch that overall just lends the iPhone 6s a much more premium feel. Next up, we have the screen, and as I said in the specs section, the iPhone 6s has a 4.7 inch screen with a resolution of 750 by 1334. It features a 9x16 aspect ratio, which is pretty nice for watching YouTube videos because still, people don't film their videos in a 2x1 aspect ratio. They should. This video is in 2x1. In the real world, the brightness is mostly fine, other than direct sunlight on bright days, where it can occasionally feel a little dim. Most of the time, it's bright enough with a nice level of contrast of 1400 to 1, a nice amount of saturation, and is really nice for watching videos or playing games. There is, however, one standout feature of the iPhone 6S's screen that was truly an innovation for the time. 3D Touch, in essence, allows for different actions based on how hard the user presses on the screen, like the trackpads on the newer MacBooks. At first, I didn't use it that much, I kind of just wrote it off as a gimmick, but when I actually started to use it, I was kind of amazed. Carrying out certain tasks like opening the camera on Instagram, having quick access to music, and most of all, being able to scroll through the text by pressing the space bar is so useful. Up until I actually started using 3D Touch, I've been highlighting different points of the text using that horrible magnifying bubble. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't that good. As soon as I found out I could use my keyboard as a trackpad to adjust my cursor, my mind was made up and I genuinely think it would be hard for me to go back to a system without this. As for how it works on the iPhone 6s, it feels really nice and tactile, responds well, and overall is one of my favorite features on the phone. After this, we got button placement. In general, Apple are one of the best in the game in this regard, and I'm pleased to say, even on a phone this age, the iPhone 6s is no exception. They're logically mapped out, nice and tactile, and include the ever essential mute switch. Seriously, every phone on the market should have this. It's just so nice being able to mute your phone without having to take it out your pocket. And on the iPhone 6s, it's as easy as ever. The lock button's located on the side of the phone, and because of the home button, there isn't any complex combinations. Just click to lock and hold to turn off your phone. Speaking of the home button, this was the last iPhone with the mechanical home button. Don't get me wrong, I do like the new home button on the iPhone 7 and 8. I like a mechanical home button too, though. As it's a mechanical home button, you don't have to mess around trying to get a real click. You get a nice tactile response out the box. Touch ID also works great. It very rarely misses, and while the home button maybe old technology, it still works very well. Another feature in which the iPhone 6s was the last of its kind of, well, on the iPhone side of things at least, was the headphone jack. When I'm using my more modern iPhone 7 and 10, I don't really miss it. Most of the time I'm using wireless headphones, and when I'm not, the adapter isn't a huge deal. It is just really nice to be able to plug this thing in on a whim, or just chuck on some nicer wired headphones. And this is an important feature to a lot of people. Overall, not much is different from any other iPhone here. In traditional iPhone, 
FN fashion, both the buttons and the layout feel fantastic. Following this, we have one of the most important features on modern smartphones, the camera. In terms of specs, the iPhone 6S features a 12 megapixel main camera with an aperture of f2.2 and honestly it's pretty good. Do keep in mind when the iPhone 6S was released, there wasn't an option for dual cameras just yet. These came with the iPhone 7 Plus. This also means that there's no portrait mode, which is basically just synthetic lighting and fake background blur. In all honesty, the secondary camera isn't necessary for some casual snaps and as long as you're not trying to take photos of the moon or get some like crazy bokeh, like f1.2 on a full frame camera, yeah because of the lack of the portrait mode, that's not going to be available on the iPhone 6s. Realistically, for casual snaps, the iPhone 6s does pretty well. In terms of overall colors, the iPhone 6s does a pretty good job. In fact, I actually made a full video where we explore the camera of the iPhone 6s in more depth up there at some point, and I basically found that the colors look pretty good. Certainly enough for photos of friends or social media, and if you really want to up your quality, say you're buying this instead of a cheap point and shoot, then you can always install something like Lightroom or Snapseed, color grade your images, and easily take your photos to that next level. Dynamic range is okay. It's it's not quite at the standards of the newer iPhones, but it's certainly usable. In fact, I shot my current wallpaper with the iPhone 6S, so that's how much faith I have in this thing with a little bit of editing. In terms of the front-facing camera, resolution of 5 megapixels, aperture of f1.8, and it's totally fine for some selfies. But, I mean, as usual, it doesn't really come all that close to the rear camera. Colors, again, look pretty good, and overall, I really believe this could be a viable option for those who want to buy a point-and-shoot with a nice interface, don't want to spend a ton of money, and want something that's nice and portable. And in that case, the 6S checks all the boxes. Moving on to video, in many ways the iPhone 6s was very much a landmark for the iPhone line, being the first one in the series to record 4K video recording on the rear camera with official support from Apple. Now this will be limited by the physical size of the sensor, I mean there's a reason that this 4K camera looks a hell of a lot better than this 4K camera. However, with some tweaking in post-production, you can go from getting images like this to images like this fairly easily. With the stock app, it's kind of limited, I mean you can't change the frame rate or the bit rate to get the most out of your camera. However, this this can be done with a third party app. My personal favorite is Pro Movie. It's pretty affordable at $2.99 and it gives you so much better control over the camera. You get shutter speed, white balance, frame rate, bit rate, manual focus, and many more. I'm not even sponsored, I just really like this app. The iPhone 6S can also do slow motion. We got 120 FPS in 1080p and 240 FPS in 720p. I personally recommend setting it to 120 as the footage is significantly higher quality, but if for some reason you do need that ultra slow mo look, then the 720p option will do the job. There is, as usual, a hit on continuous autofocus and dynamic range, but it's certainly not to the point where it's unusable, especially with AE lock. Overall, while a camera may not be destroying the flagship phones of today, it's still pretty good. And if you want some really nice images, there is, of course, Lightroom, Snapseed, RNI Film, or, of course, Pro Movie to get some really nice looking images with the iPhone 6S. Next, we have OS and app performance. In my testing with media services like YouTube and Netflix, or games like Animal Crossing and Coffee Corp, the iPhone 6S still very much works into 2020. I rarely drop frames and it very rarely crashes. Now of course gaming performance will vary on the games you play. I mean I personally like more casual games but if you want to play some more hardware intensive games then performance may not be as good. As far as social media goes the iPhone 6s still works great as the theme goes with iPhones in general. And with apps like Instagram or Twitter everything was smooth from the cameras to the stories everything worked great. My 6s is actually running iOS 13 which may actually end up being the last edition of iOS for the 6s. More on that next. But everything feels snappy, the UI doesn't like and overall using this thing in 2020 is a really nice experience. Now if we're following the traditional Apple support cycle, iOS 13 could very well be the last version of iOS that the 6s gets. There is a very small possibility that the 6s could receive an extra year of updates like the 5s did, but as I said this is unlikely. This means that you won't get the new features that iOS 14 will bring along and eventually developers will stop supporting your device. As for that last statement it really depends on the app developer, this doesn't happen right away, so whether or not you want to deal with that and for how long you want to keep your iPhone should both be a consideration before you buy the 6s in 2020. Following on, we have battery life. My battery health is at 91% and as I said in the spec section, the iPhone 6s battery is rated at 1750 milliamp hours. But how does this translate in real world usage? With day to day usage in apps like Instagram, iMessage, music and occasionally YouTube, I can generally get around 5 hours and I found it totally usable in the real world, I was never stranded anywhere with no charge. However, on media heavy days and with tasks like YouTube, this 
decreases significantly. On some days, it wouldn't even make it to 2 p.m. In summary, if you're gonna be away from a charger for more than five hours of general usage, it'll most likely be flat. And if you like your media, just make sure you have a charger with you. Okay, so we talked about the headphone jack, but how do the built-in speakers sound? The iPhone 6s has a single downward firing speaker that, while not as good as the ones on the newer phones, is totally fine for some casual listening. A quick description of the sound of these speakers will be vocals stand out well, and there isn't all that much bass. In short, if you want quality, use headphones. Otherwise, this speaker will get the job done. Overall, the iPhone 6s to this day is considered a landmark phone in Apple's aluminium series, and for good reason. In 2020, there are a few things you need to consider, mainly how long do you want to keep it, and if you want to keep it for a long time, do you want iOS 14? Otherwise, this phone is better than it has any right to be, as it's almost five years old, and even in 2020, I very much enjoyed using this phone. All right, guys, so that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this one. As always, thank you for watching. Remember to like the video if you want to see more content like this, and smash that subscribe button. I'm done for now, and I will see you guys in the next one. Oh.